Hey, welcome back everyone. As you can see in front of you, there is a Parker 51 Vacuumatic. And this is one of the two I showed you from the last video, clearly, but I'm a demonstrator as this is all clear all the way through. So we'll be able to see the Vacuumatic system working and we'll get to see everything kind of once it's taken apart, cleaned up, put back together, and the Parker 51 in all its glory. There is the other pen that I had. It's a Plum Aerometric, and I have that one off to the side, all mostly taken apart except for maybe the sack protector. So that I just wanted to get a head start on, and it's much simpler um, than the Aerometric. So once we get this part taken, this one taken apart, and starting to get the process going, I can jump to the Aerometric at certain points just to show the specifics of that one. But it's much simpler, so I thought we'd focus on this one. And also, since this is a demonstrator, I'm going to um, do a little bit, something a little bit different today. I'm going to be more involved in the full demonstration of what I've done. I think I've spared a lot of the process, the, the tedious bits of the process, throughout my videos. Um, I've tended to do my work, come back and show you the exploded view of the pens, um, everything broken down and laid out. But I think with this one, um, you know, going along with the demonstrator motif, I'm actually going to do some clips where I show the heating and disassembly. And this is a good one to do because it does get into some little different things, a little different material than what we've had with the celluloids. Um, we've had some plastics with the Triumphs, um, the last one, the Triumph, the Touchdown, and the um, Snorkel Filler. Um, but not a lot of heat necessary for those and those actually do come apart fairly easily So, you know, I didn't have to kind of go quite into the nuance that I want to go into with this pen So I will be doing that and there'll be some speed ups just to kind of keep this video from ballooning um, But I think you know, let me know if you like it if you want to be a little more detailed and literally show some of these processes, but um Hopefully this is a good one to show it on and you actually appreciate um, that particular method with this particular pen. So let me just talk a little bit about the pen. I can show you the pieces and show you what I'm going to be focusing on. And then I want to talk a little bit about the material and which feeds into why I want to do this pen. So um, this is a stainless steel cap. Maybe it's called Lustreloy um, still. I'm not sure if at some point they changed the name, but typically they're called Lustreloy caps. Their own stainless steel composite. And this one looks to be pretty good condition. I don't really see any bangs on it, any dents. Um, maybe a little bit more matte. We'll see how it cleans up the Simicrome, but I'm, I don't know if I'm going to be shooting to get this thing reflective or mirror surfaced. We have the cap jewel up top. Typically they're all clear or a little bit milkyish. This one looks to maybe, hopefully that's just ink underneath, and getting the jewel out will be able to clean that out a bit. We have the clip. This looks like just a standard Art Deco Aero clip, so this might be an early one. I'll, I'll, we'll see if we have a date code, but just based on the clip, might be an early one. And this one's pretty secure, so we'll have to work on getting that out. And I think there's only one thing on the cap in terms of what it says. I can show. Let's find the focus. There we go. And all it says is Parker. No 51, no Made in USA, just Parker. So I'll try to see if that plays into dating it as well. Zoom back out just a touch. And as for this guy, there's going to be three parts I'm going to focus on because um, unlike the Aerometric where you just unscrew the body and you have your Aerometric filler, which in itself is a little bit of a tough thing to get off. This is going to have three points where we're going to worry about our heat and getting things apart. So just like any vacuumatic, we're going to have this area where the the vacuum plunger setup actually threads into the barrel. So that's going to be one source. The barrel as the vessel, of course, needs to be airtight. So it's going to be another thread source right here. And that thread store source is a little connector. It's threaded on this side and it's threaded on this side. And that is one piece going through. And you can think of this cap band um, as the, not cap band, but the, 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 not the clutch, but the, oh, I'm butchering this one, but the ring where the cap connects to. 
um, is roughly the center point. You can think of it that way. So it, it's larger threaded barrel here, the slightly sized down barrel here that's threaded, and it's going to thread onto the hood. And in this hood is a collector, and through that collector runs the feed, and you have the nib. And this is a nice hood because it pretty much covers up pretty much all that nib. There are some other pen manufacturers, they call them hooded, but because they expose so much more of the nib typically, um, those would probably be better termed semi-hooded. Um, but that's where we're going to be focusing our attention. And then hopefully once we get all this cleaned up, we'll show you the little bits in here. And sometimes there's a little bit of a uh, little rubber gasket or seal in here to help make it airtight, but we'll see if this has it. But these are the places where I'm going to focus. One, two, three. And it could be a bit of a chore, so we will see. And just to kind of introduce the tools, the primary tools I'm going to use, I'm going to throw this off um, to the side. Actually, let me step back because I was going to talk about the material. So this is a molded plastic. I think this might be the first pen or round where the Parker company actually used plastics. Now we saw them again like in the touchdown and in the snorkel filler but there's not a lot of heat involved. Those come apart fairly easily so didn't have to get as nitpicky um, about it but this is one where I think it's worth it because these plastics do become brittle and I have seen them over come they have come to me um, with some warping and some damage probably from being in a hot storage thing or somebody's hot house in a hot drawer so let me show you what I mean and it's especially common in this hood so cap that for a second and I'll pull off one from the side here is a nice gray one that I have again this one is a vacuumatic which still has a vacuum and I've used this as a piece as a parts pen um, because this one came and you can see where heat has warped it. Let me see if I can zoom in and kind of give a better presentation. But yeah, you see almost how it kind of steps down down here and you can feel where it's shrunk around maybe that connector in here stepping down towards the collector connector collector. Let me say those distinctly. Um, but yeah, I've got many like this, both uh, Parker 51s, Parker 21s. Um, I've seen a couple like Parker, what do I say? Um, oh, what's the one with the arrow up top? Is that a Parker 60, Parker 65? Or is it 61? Oh, I forget the number, but you're going to hate me for saying it. But the one with the arrow, and I'll see them kind of shrunken right here. Um, I've also seen some with some cracks right here. Um, sometimes here, the barrel not so much. The barrels tend to be okay, but I do see splits along this area. Maybe someone's been trying to get into it and they crack it, but not uncommon to find splits up here. And just like any vacuumatic, you can probably get some splits back here, but I honestly have not seen them too often. Maybe because, I don't know. I don't know why that would be, but I, I tend not to have found too many of these that have been cracked. Um, but We'll see. And I'll put the cap back on, but just want to show you this. So we're going to be using heat. So it's going to be good to be slow, patient, and judicious with our heat. And th that is kind of why I really want to just kind of show you the um, long and slow method of this. And I think I saw something recently online where it was a video from many years ago. Some guy would actually put this in fairly hot water, not boiling, but you know, 160-ish degrees, 170-ish degrees. And I mean, these plastics can take that heat apparently. And that's how he would kind of soften kind of the glues and expand things. And it would take him a few soaks. Um, I don't know if I'm that bold to do it or to try it. Cause you know, I've done this enough that I know that I can just do a some seconds of heating and kind of feel and not risk just letting random heat while this thing is soaking do what it's going to do so i'm going to do my tried and true method but there are some videos out there of people using wet heat so let me go ahead and do the thing i was about to do and kind of let me show you the main things i'm going to be using for this repair and probably most of all of these i think you've seen so i'm going to be using of course as a vacuumatic my vacuumatic wrench set so the little clamp wrench and the three attachments, this one, these Parker 51s, I think I've always used 
the smaller of the die sets, but whatever lets you thread, grip, and be able to untwist the um, plunger set. Lefty loosey, righty toddy on those. We will also have, because we're going to take it out, we need to replace it with a diaphragm, and this is a standard size. It has the pellet ball inside. We're going to be cutting this guy down. So, of course, scissors, something with which to measure, a little bit of talc to reduce some friction, and like I did, I think I showed this with the Vacumatic Major, um, I have this lubricant that I got, that I got from Independence. Independence. I'm going I'm to say it both ways forever, I'm, I'm sure. Um, but again, if you don't have this, some silicone grease, and that should do you pretty well. And probably, aside from the hair dryer, your best friends are going to be grippers because you're doing a lot of heating, a lot of gripping, a lot of slow, steady turning to, until you get something loose. So some good grippers are also going to be very important for this. And I will go ahead and point out that I'm going to be replacing these soon because you can see how mushed and kind of worn this thing is getting. So I'll probably use it for this one. Then I'll try to be making some new squares. So remember, these do break down. Feel free, super cheap to get, make, make some. And bring that back. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop this one. So if you don't want to see all the little bit of heating and the twisting and the tedious process, which I will be speeding up just to not have it be too monotonous, but so you can see how long it takes um, me to do it, um, feel free to speed up. Um, as I get better at the videos, I'll try to do some chapter markers from time to time and get into doing that, but feel free to speed up until we get to the cleaning uh, and reassembling part. Um, and as far as the tedium goes, I'm not going to show you the polishing because it's the same stuff. I'll kind of flash the camera to kind of show, remind everybody like what I use, but I'm not going to do the polishing. I think we've gotten beyond that. So if you want to see some polishing techniques, plenty of them online and I have a few in my first couple of videos, two, three videos where I kind of go over my pads and my creams and there's going to be nothing special about this um, other than maybe make sure you have maybe a Q-tip to kind of get into the deeper area. So I'll cut, cut here and we'll see you in the bathroom because that's where my hair dryer is plugged in. Okay, so let's see how this goes. Hopefully the sound in this slightly bigger room is okay. But what I have is this hair dryer, nothing fancy. It's got hot, warm, cool, and I always use it on hot. And it's also got a low and high feature. Um, I often use low, just so it's not blowing so loud and, and you know, heat burning my hands so much. So low, I think, does just fine. And I've mentioned, I think I showed this before, but this actually has like a little chamber on the front, which I kind of like, because I wouldn't be holding this up too close to the nozzle anyway. And this gives me a little bit of space where I feel like, okay, I'd probably be holding it right about here. And I have a little bit of side holes, there's a couple of little vents on the side, so it's not like super highly direct and there's a little bit of blow off, so I can kind of sense how hot things are getting, so. Let me see if I can, I'm kneeling on the floor just so I can have the angle and you're not seeing the whole bathroom, but let me see if I can figure out a decent way to do this. So cap off and I'm going to take my grippies, you know, just to kind of see, maybe I get lucky. Nope. I'm kind of changing where I'm holding. I'm trying to debate, am I going to take the barrel off or am I going to take the hood off? Let's see if we can go for the hood. I mean, I'm sorry, the, let's go for the body, the barrel. Let's, let's try that. So, really is, I'm gonna get right here. I've got some other bits and stuff of them, some pens that I'm kind of getting some air around. So I'm gonna put something up front and keep them in line. Okay, maybe I do a bit of that. Let's see.
I am chagrined. I am so sorry. Um, I told you guys some falsehoods. Luckily, I realized my falsehood um, as I was heating up the pen. And maybe it was fortuitous um, that I was in the bathroom having to kneel because I haven't done a Parker 51 for a while. So I'll tell you what mistake I made, why I think I made it, and what made me catch it at the last second. So um, earlier today, I was working on the other one, the aerometric one, the plum, just to kind of get it apart so I could only really need to do one pen in front of the camera. So what I was doing earlier today was, you know, I was working on the hood um, from the from the connector, the connector that was I was thinking about in my mind, and that's that's what I'm talking about. I mean, there's the little cap catch in there in between, like right in there. But this is the connector I was I was thinking about, and somehow I put the two in my head, thinking, oh, this is also in that version in the vacuumatic, but that is not the case. So happily, that's the connector I mean threaded here and then threaded at the bottom to get the barrel. So that's what was in my head. And I stupidly probably would have been trying to do this for a while until it, it clicked and like, why is this not coming? But as I was on my, on my knees, kind of trying to be in a good position to do this, I was staring at this as I was heating it. I was like, hey, that's weird. I don't see any threads through the section, I mean through the barrel, that show me that something is in there. And that's when it dawned on me that, wait a minute, the beauty of this is you can just make this all one piece and the hood threads onto the barrel. So that's why I suddenly switched to the hood, revealing basically the threaded neck of the barrel. So. I'm going to leave the other part, um, I'm not going to re-record, I'm not going to put this together and re-record, I will leave it in there, I will take my ridicule, but it was just one of those things, I hadn't done one in a while, so I totally forgot, but I'm glad you were there to see the mistake, see the thought process. But what we also did, and got a little bit lucky, I guess, um, oh, there it is, but I was able to get the breather tube out very easily, and th the comment I'll make and I kind of tried to see how easy it would be, and so I wound up just kind of flashing it in front of the camera, was if this is in the neck, I would say be very careful. At this point, you might even be worth just soaking it, or if you haven't soaked it, you know, I could have probably pre-soaked this pen. But if you get to this point, start soaking it, or at least barely try it to see if it comes out. Because this is a very sticky point, literally because the ink in there has been caked, um, there may be some shrinkage. So if you wind up squeezing this and twisting, you could break this collector. So I tried it, it, wasn't it actually came out easily, so I was lucky, but this is a point where you can probably just stick this pen in the soak, let that stuff work its way out, and then try to get it. Maybe a little bit of heat to melt any little goo, any ink, but be very careful right here. And then I think I tried it, I also tried this, because this is the feed within the nib, and the feed is going within this collector, and basically friction fitting this nib and holding it tight. So I just kind of gave it a little pull, a little wiggle, and actually, now that I'm doing it, it's actually coming apart. Like there's the nib coming off, but again, drop that in some water. This is another point where, you know what, if you got this far, give it a try, but don't try very much, because this is very thin, very brittle plastic. So that was me just kind of pulling straight, but this is the point, I'm not gonna try to force that. I'm gonna go ahead and throw this in my water, it has a little bit of soap in it, and that's I'm gonna let that take care of itself, because I have broken a feed that way. So here's the hood. Nice and inky. This is going to clean up so nice. I like the contrast. Part of the reason I didn't pre-soak this is I really want to see the contrast of cleaning up a lot of this ink. And then we also have this guy. I was trying to fiddle and get him off, but this cap ring should come off, but he's probably stuck on there with goo or maybe a little bit of shrinkage. So I'm going to let this soak before I try to get this guy off and maybe I'll use a little bit of heat later, but this cap ring should come off. And so what's left here, 
And let me show you what I'm throwing this into real quick. And I did this for a reason. Boom. So this is just a little, a little bit of soapy water. Cold soapy water. And I just want to show you, I mean, this is not a scientific method, but I just want to show you this clear, scentless ammonia, how much I really use in this just to kind of help get at the ink. So really, I'm gonna look over the camera. It's really just like a quick little pour. I'm not putting much in there at all, like very little compared to the volume of that. So it's really dilute 10% or less, you know? So just wanted to give you a sense of how much I actually use. And then, so I got through the hood in there. Um, as I scratched at the cap, actually, what I thought was ink under it might actually be ink on top of it. So, uh, you know, before I even try to kind of unscrew the cap gem, the cap jewel, I'm going to go ahead and throw this in there as well, kind of get stuff out of there and let that kind of do its soaking. And so what we're left with now is the vacuumatic part. Okay, and we'll get the vacuumatic tool that I have. Get the compression wrench, the red end of it. We'll get it down here. Make sure that threads correctly. There we go. And let's see. There we go. Usually don't have to put heat, but so that was good. This one did feel pretty springy, so let's actually see if there was an intact diaphragm on this one. Let's see if we can get it to pull out. I might have to get a little stick to... Yeah, let me see if I can help push it out. Get a little dowel. Let's get this guy. Go ahead and check the dowels and see. Too big. Get the medium sized. Put a little pressure on the inside while I wiggle and pull. Mm, no, that's kind of in there. end up soaking this guy. I don't want to mess up the diaphragm of the cup or anything. So I'm going to go ahead and soak the whole thing as a unit. Put that into my solution. And let's see if we can get the water in there. Ooh. Let's see what kind of mess we're going to make, actually. Let's, maybe this will answer it. Let's see. Like maybe there is a little bit of a. Uh, I think the diaphragm is intact. I think I can actually push out some of that, push some air out, kind of get a little vacuum going. But I was just going to leave it soaking in there. So, all right, we'll give that a little bit of time, and then I'll come back and we'll get everything cleaned up and see where we are from there. So we'll tune back in in a few minutes. Okay, everything's been soaking. I did a little bit of pushing and pulling on the plunger. And yes, indeed, we did have an intact sack. So I was going to try to finish pulling it out in front of you guys. Okay. I'll have to soak that, see if I can brush some of that out. But we had a sack. I'm going to try to pull. Oh, it broke. So we're going to do another adventure of getting the ball out of the cup. This had a nice metal seating mechanism, so I was really seated in there. I really had to push and I used a little bit of heat um, at that spot to really finally get it out. So we have a good plunger unit. Okay, and I had to really kind of edge up the, the catch of the clutch ring. It really had some gunk ducks up stuff, and I really kind of just 
felt it a little wobble, so I was able to just work it around, work it around, work it around, and really just after a while, whatever goo, this darkened, probably um, some kind of adhesive that's just gotten dirty and caked over the years, finally gave way, so I'll have to be brushing that off. Let's see. Another good thing was I kind of took the top of my cap, and sure enough, after a little bit of rubbing, that was something ink or whatever it was dried on the outside, so not under the jewel, but I'll still want to try to get the jewel just to kind of get everything cleaned up. Or, you know, you don't necessarily have to take this off. If it looks intact and clean, you, you know, could make the decision not to. What else? Here's the hood. A little bit of residual junk in the threads, so. I might have to go through some brushing and soaking, brushing and soaking um, to slowly get some of the darker stuff out because I want this to be as clear as I can get it. Blind cap, nice and clean. Boom. Alright, here's the collector and a lot of that gunk has come off. So let's see if I can do a little bit of twist. There it goes. And be gentle, don't overly twist. If it's resisting, maybe try a little bit of heat because you don't want to break off the feed. And that came out pretty well. I mean, I'll have to do a little bit of brushing, maybe see if I can get anything else out of there. And if you get it really clean, I'll just flash the other one. But here's the one that came from the Aerometric Filler. They, they get pretty darn clear. You can get these nice and clean. And this one had a little bit of ink, nothing like what was on this one, but it came out clean, so I have high hopes for this guy. There is my breather tube. I'll do a little bit of work on that. And here is the gold nib. Now, it'll say something on it. Let me see if I can just take a look at the loop. This one says uh, Parker, made in USA. There's RUP, not sure what that means. And 1947, 1947 nib. And I did take a quick look here, and there is, I'm not even gonna try, it's gonna be clear. But it does say Parker 51, made in USA, and there's an eight with no dots. So it looks like maybe 1948 pen using a 1947 nib. So I think we've got our date for this one. But what I think I can do now is I'm going to do a lot of this cleaning. So this is going to be some soaking, some brushing, soaking, some brushing. So I'll probably go back to some soapy ammonia to really kind of soften some, some of the skunk. And I will use my cut down toothbrush. I'll use my pipe cleaners um, on the insides and some Q-tips really trying to get this stuff off. And then I will probably just use my polishes. I don't think there's anything too major on here. I want to see how my Novo plastic polishes work and just as rem oh oh I'm sorry the ball did come out with the with the sack so that is an empty ball cup so that is lucky for us I was actually going to try my Dremel tool method but looks like the ball came out so that was lucky so that that is good to go so I will do as much as I can to clean this up use my polishes just to see what the polishes do without you know getting down to micro mesh unless I feel like that it's unsatisfactory and then the last thing we'll probably tackle is trying to get you know I'll go back over the aerometric a little bit show the differences but try to get the aerometric kind of uh, off and cleaned up so we can replace the sack so that's where we'll leave it for now and I'll be back hopefully reassembling with this reassembling this with you soon Okay, I'm back. It's been quite a few days. I really tried to get this thing cleaned up. Um, as you can see, there's still a bit of kind of staining and dinginess on this thing. I have used ammonia soaks. I use bleach soaks. I have used my plastic polishes, um, the Novo one, Novus ones that I've shown many, 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 many times. I even use baking soda and uh, vinegar to try to see if I can bubble things away, but try as I might, I think this particular demonstrator has just 
a decent amount of staining to it and I think I've heard about people using like hydrogen peroxide and um, UV light. I mean, I don't have that kind of setup, but maybe in the future this is something, you know, I might try on this. But um, if anybody has any thoughts about how to get some plastic clear or de-stain uh, plastic, please let me know. I'd love to try to take this pen apart again and get it to look good. But be that as it may, I think it's it cleaned up well. I mean, it's clean and we'll just go with what we have. And just to kind of show you what I was hoping would happen, here is the collector for the Plum Parker 51. This one, I don't know, maybe the pen wasn't used quite so much or didn't have standing ink, but compared to what was in the demonstrator, definitely a far cry. But I toyed around with the idea of using, you know, swapping them out, but I think this is just stand out. I mean, might as well just keep it all together and let the color be the color that it's going to be. So here we go. But let's go ahead and put this back together a little bit. We'll do the nose part first and then I can kind of quickly come back and do the vacuumatic part. So what we have here is, let's see. So here we have the nib and I want my loop to see. I think I said it, 1947, is that what I said? It's been so many days I can't remember. Yeah. 1947, yes, I did read the nib out for us. So what we're basically basically going to do is put the nib back on the feed. And the feed will kind of go up until the shoulder until it reaches the shoulders um, of the nib itself. So we'll kind of start there. I'm going to hold it in place and we just take this collector and work it on down. It's, it will seat itself. Um, there will only be so far down that you can push everything. So I think that will be good for people to be aware of. So don't go trying to push it down all the way, but it will seat itself. And the idea of the collector is kind of like a capacitor uh, for uh, a battery really or anything electrical so one of the innovations of the Parker 51 was this collector unit so the nib is always bathed in ink rather than ink being fed from the back coming up the ink channel feeding itself to the nib you have all these little combs so can I focus in you have all these little combs that kind of store ink in between so there's always going to be something ink touching this feed and nib all the way around so it'll um, kind of resist drying out so that's why i kind of liken it to a capacitor it's holding its charge this in this case the ink is the charge so it's ready to just kind of feed its ink all the way through so then we shall put the breather tube and nice yellow what i thought about seeing back if seeing back i could find a clear clear or one or a less opaque one but you know this is what came with it so i will stick with it and you can feed it back up in there get everything kind of back and even and do be careful when you're squeezing this these little fins do break off and they, they can be very brittle um, they can also be brittle down here you will sometimes find cracks down here where maybe somebody's put a tube or something in and it's kind of cracked but you will find cracks here You'll find broken fins here, so do be careful. And of course, we know that's going to fit back in here, and that's that's where it will ultimately go. So let's do this. We'll go ahead and put that ring on. And one thing we can do, I think we did this with uh, oh, which one was it? Was it the touchdown or one of the triumph pins? But you kind of have to know where this hood is going to thread down to. So we put our ring on, we thread our hood on, and take note of where the bottom section, the tip, is going to be. So again, let's kind of put our thumb as a marker. I'll take the hood off again. Am I all the way out? Okay. We will take it and put the bottom of the feed and nib and try to line it up as much as we can with where we had 
put our thumb. I'm just making sure that the feed and the nib look pretty well lined up. I don't want the feed necessarily sticking out too much from the nib itself. So just do a little, little double check things. And so let's see how close I was. Mm. Oh, I was a little bit off. Let's see if we can get it focused in. And you'll see that I'm just a little bit too looking down on it to the right. So what I can do is just try to get a sense of, if I take this back off, I am going to move this just a touch to the left. And really, I'm just going to kind of do this over and over again until I get to the point where I am happy. And let me look over the camera. Maybe just a touch more. Just a touch. Let me zoom back out so you can get a better sense. So again, I'm going to go just a hair to the left. and lock it back down and that is where hmm, am i happy with that let's see can we see it that's pretty good yeah i'm fairly happy with that yeah we can let that be and rather than, you know, put some adhesive or shellac that's going to discolor, I think what I'm going to do is just put a little silicone grease right there just to make sure we have a nice airtight seal and that this is something that, because I really do think I'm going to come back to it and try to re-clarify that. So actually, since I don't have my silicone next to me, I'll just leave this here. Take it back. Did it stay? I must have touched it a little bit because it's a little bit off. Hmm. That's pretty good. I'll come back and fiddle with it. Since I'm going to come back in here and uh, put some, some grease on it, I'll come back and fiddle with it a little bit more. So let's go ahead and put the vacuumatic diaphragm I and mean, I kind of want to do one more thing just because on another video I had done an extraction technique with the oops there we go with the split in the ball method to see if I could stick a needle in it and separate it so I'm just curious if this even if, if they're consistent showing all the balls having a split so I'm just going to take this one out Mm. doesn't look like it this one oh maybe oh there it is yes it does have a split i don't know if it, that's so small if you can see it but let's hold it up and let me find it again so small Maybe am I kidding myself? Was I just imagining it? No. It's very small. I don't even know if you guys can see it. But suffice it to say, there's a very slim, and I don't think you can, and I'm not gonna try harder to find it, but there's a very slim little seam right between the two hemispheres of that ball. Hopefully it's something you could see in the cup to try that needle method and refer to the, um, Vacuumatic major video to, to know what I'm talking about, but it's, Maybe it's possible. Maybe it's consistent. But anyway, let's just go ahead and take our new one back out. And we're going to do our usual thing. Let's see. So here's my thing. Here's my Spring And I will get my stick the stick that I should have had ready Everything's always in the drawer beside me, so that's why 
let me uh, I'm lazy and just dig into it sometimes so here's one that a little taper with a plateau this is a little bit larger this time I'm going to give it a bit of tension keep that ball on the plateau I'm going to put a little spit on it see if I can push that ball in hopefully there we go pull back some of that a little more tension a little more spit hmm this one's not as straightforward as the other one became See if I can increase the, the mouth of the cup a bit. Oh, I was going to find that ball and just see how big is it compared to what I what I have here. Let's take a look. So the new one is this white ball. Let's see if we can zoom in and do a size comparison because I'm having such a hard time. So here's the new one, that white ball there. Here's the old one, that black ball. They do look like they're different sizes. That white one looks so big, a little bit bigger compared to the black one. So maybe I really am dealing with something that's just a little oversized now. Hmm. I am chagrined. I wonder if I can. Just do a little manipulation of the cup mouth. Just try to ream it a little bit to see if I can open the lips just a little bit. Not much, but just just enough. Okay. So let's set these to the side. This is actually good to know. Boom. Okay. So this one I'll do heat, see if I can expand it a touch and try to put a new diaphragm in, but um, we'll come back when this is all said and done. And that was a decent idea. So I put a little heat on the cup, 20-30 uh, seconds, and was able to use my smaller wooden dowel again to kind of push it back. The other idea I had, and it, maybe this would have been a smarter idea rather than just trying to use heat and force anything, but if I had replaced, taken out the white ball that's in these new replacements, pop it out just like that, and I was just handling it, um, put that black ball in, in its place, it's probably rolled around here somewhere on my desk, but if I, had I replaced the white ball with the black ball that seemed to be smaller from the other one, that probably would have been a good fit. Um, so I think either one works, but now I don't have to waste another white ball so I think I'm happy it worked and it's in there so let's go ahead and get it cut down and for that we can do this fairly quickly because we had a successful one the other day the other video so let's go ahead and put down the point where it comes out this is my zero mark and I'm going to cut at the inch mark. Let's bring it down. I'm going to make it flat. Actually, here's what I was going to do. I was going to, I brought my X-Acto knife 
So I was going to get a flat edge. That's where I'm going to cut it. So I was going to take my flat edge, make it really flat, and just cut it this way. There we go. And that works. And then I shall find my dowel. We have the dowel. We have some talc. Get that rolled around a little bit. Flick off the excess. Put the fat end in. See if we can get it rolled up on itself. And this is where the bigger one might come into handy. Take up more space. Or, how's this guy? This guy was pretty tight. Yeah, there we go. It's starting to roll up on itself. And we will just roll it easy peasy like. Pushing from the back forward. We'll get it rolled up onto the, the tapered metal part. It's going to seal it. And there we go. Easy. We'll check the end. We come up. See the pellet poking out the donut? We have a good size. So there we go. We'll come back, take some of that lubricant, and I will kind of wipe off some possible talc that probably got on here. So I'm going to put some of this lubricant at the tip to help it slide into place. A little lubricant here at the top of the taper just to help it seal. Okay. Lock that down. Make sure everything's seated well. Okay. And we come back here to the back the tail end. Let's wiggle it down. It's seated. I think I pulled it back and got it off off the seat. That was my fault. But let's see how we correct. We just come back in with our dowel, let it walk itself back up, and it's back on. Easy peasy. I think because I semi-hesitated and kind of pulled it back out the barrel, which had it get pulled off, so. Tip. And the point of seating. Okay. Then we find it here. Wiggle it down. Don't hesitate, don't pull it back. Just let it go on forward. And we'll start sliding this into place. getting tight. I don't want to twist it. So I will bring out my tool. We'll get that on. Then we'll take the clamp. We'll get that seated down. And I'm looking for the edge of this to come just below the level of the barrel, is where I kind of tend to like it to sit. Just a bit above. I'll go a little bit further. A little bit more. Feels like it could still go. Now it's just at the level. I'll go just a touch more. That's getting tight. I don't want to push it too much more. It's just below, so let's go ahead and take the back of it right here. Slide it on. Does it make a nice seam? Yes, it does. So I can start there. It's all the way down. A little bit of a seam. And we can check it all the way. 
way down. And this is also the point of where I did the vacuumatic uh, major, where had I not put this on, you can look down the barrel and just see that nice donut come at you. But I think since we can see it, I see it come down to a taper. It's not catching on itself. It seems to be going straight in, straight out. So we have a good seat. Okay, so I can put this down. There we go. Everything is good. I can come back in a little bit, put a little bit of a silicone grease there, get a good seal. And I'll let everything kind of set up for a little bit and do my polishing on the outside, trying to scrub this down, do the polishing, make it nice and smooth, and see if I can get any of this dinginess off. Um, and then we will do the cap. And I'll, the some, thing I'll say about the cap was I was not able to get the jewel off, but it did kind of pre-polish up a little bit well, so I'm not worried about trying to force it off and risk breaking the jewel just to get it off. But typically, under here, and I have another one. Let me see if this one comes off. Mm, not so much. Yeah. I find it, that it's often not worth trying to chase the jewels. I mean, you can polish the cap around the clip, get the jewel, and if that's pretty seated on there, it's. I don't think it's worth breaking the jewel or... or spending days and days trying to get this off because I tried I tried heating this up trying to get the jewel off but overall I think the caps in great condition so I'm not worried about getting in there and here's the other part so while this kind of sets up I will switch over to the other one this is the aerometric and recall what I said where I had gotten things mixed up that you know you've got the the hood, the cap ring, and then you have the back part. And this also, <laughs> dang, whatever glue was on this particular, these particular pens was really tough. Try as I might, I could not heat this enough, soak this enough, do anything to kind of get this back part off. The good thing was though, I did get this sack really clean. It looks pretty close, you know, it's a little more opaque, but it looks pretty close to what a fresh sack would be and it's squeezy it's it's squishy and it would pick up water very easily so I'm not going to try to fight this thing just to get a new sack in when the sack actually feels pretty darn good and so what I thought I would do is I have another Parker 51 aerometric um, that actually probably needs I could probably use this sack to replace this one so same kind of a thing. This one's a little bit more beat up. It's lost its chrome. It has the same kind of end cap. So these are similar. And what these actually do is there are little bitty threads right there, just above where the sack goes on that this would screw on to and so here's what the sack looks like this one is one I had, I had bought online and so I haven't gotten to really fully replace anything but let me see if I can just you know show you what we're dealing with and what's in there there it goes and there goes my camera but pull it off and this is good timing so we have the metal breather tube just like the other one into I mean, the feed under the hood, this is the breather tube for it, it would slide in there. And this back one is, yes, yeah, plenty of this kind of textured surface to put on your silicone sack. And it's the same kind of a thing. You would do your uh, shellac, you can slide this on over it, and just wiggle it, wiggle it on. And this is a bit rough, it doesn't have the nice slickness of the shellac but what you would do is the same kind of thing we've done before and other people have also you know if you want to put the breather tube in and have it loose so that you can slide that on a little easier you can do that give it a spin and then with the loose tube you can kind of find the breather hole and slip it in that way so it's in there now 
Yeah, I did it. Did I get the breather tube? Nope, oh, nope, it's not in there yet. But now you have to struggle to find the hole. Let's see if you can get it in there. But you have two ways of doing it. And if you get frustrated enough... Oop, did I find it? There, I found it. Yeah, I got the breather tube in, and that's how you would replace the sack. And you would screw it back on. And I wouldn't bother shellacking that or doing anything else, just so you can get back to it. So um, I'll take this back off. But this is what you would do, and this is what I would expect this one to do. But whatever adhesive they used, super on there. So let me just take this all off to the side. And we'll continue on with this one. So I think I'm going to reuse this until I think, well, maybe this fails and I'll struggle again. But recall, here's the breather tube for this one, which I'll have to po polish up. But we'll put it in the breather tube and it'll wind up coming in this way as we get the tube, as we get the pen back. But let me get everything polished and we'll come back and see how everything finally does. And we will actually get to see the vacuum in order. So I'll come back with this all polished up and I'll have the other one polished up and we can kind of put it back together too, just for completion's sake. And we'll talk about them a little bit, do some writing samples and hopefully this video won't be too much of a mess and we'll talk soon all right so let's go ahead and get the aerometric put back together so everything's been cleaned and polished i just used my novice polish to kind of superficially clean this up i didn't take any abrasives as far as my micro mesh pad so this is really just a good plastic polish on this guy so let's go ahead and get him put back together and let's start with the pen itself all right so let's go ahead and get the feed and the breather tube and this is a new breather tube the other one just had enough corrosion on it that you know i i just thought i should replace it and i've had these replacement metal breather tubes from anderson pens for quite a while so i figured i'd start using it so let's go ahead and take the feed we can go ahead and kind of slip it there into the collector we'll take this nib We'll seat it down, kind of get the feed just up to the shoulder. And we may play around with that, but let's go ahead and let's put it right there. Okay with that. And we will just push it down into the collector and it will self-seat like, like the other one did. And there we go. Nice like that. And we can take, let's see how should we do this. Let's go ahead and take the clutch ring and we'll go ahead and seat this in. And I did leave the sack in, so just be mindful that you're not going to stab that um, breather tube into the sack. And there we go. And I guess I should have tested to see where the cap comes down to, but I didn't. But let's just go ahead and see where. Oh, wow. That was super lucky. Yeah, I got almost right on it. So let's just kind of do our game again. So I'm gonna come a little bit to the right. A little bit to the right. You never know how much these things are moving. Let's go ahead and do that. Nice firm. And just that little bit, almost feels like I need to come back to the left. Arg, this is the back and forth. Let me just do one more little adjustment. And if that doesn't do it, then I'll just finish it up off camera. There we go. I'm not sure if that really moved much, but let's see. There we go. I like that. I think that's pretty good. I'm gonna leave it right there, okay? So, that is it. That's basically the pen itself. Super easy. Now we have the cap, and I was able to get the cap jewel off this one, and looks like it has a little bit of a metal cuff on it, and there is 
in here a little bit of a cap liner that's in there. It's kind of held in place by the clutch on the inside of the cap, which I have a tool to get those out, but I don't really tend to, uh, can we see kind of that arched clutch in there? But I tend not to get these out just because if I don't need to, um, I try not to because it does require using a tool that kind of stretches the cap metal out a little bit. So if I don't need to, I won't. And I will do a video at one point because I have quite a few caps with some dings. And the reason I got the D clutching tool was to see if maybe I could do some burnishing and kind of get dents out of some of the caps. So I'll do a video on that and see how it, how it goes. But We'll see the inside at, a, at another point. And here's a little tool that slides up into caps so I can keep that cap up towards the top. And I'm gonna go ahead and take the clip and find there is a little bit of a, what would I call it? Just like a little bit of a hump there just to kind of catch the clip itself so that's kind of where the clip seats and you can tell because there is a little bit more of an extra wear spot where this has been seated so that makes sense let's line it up let's keep it covered there we go and this is as easy as screwing it back in let me just get it started there we go so i'm going to get it started use my thumb Cut the cap so I can take this thing out. I think, I hope, and make sure everything's lined up. Get it back to where it's seated on that lip. See if I can, maybe I do need a little bit more, but I think I'm not able to quite grip it, so I might have to just come back with my, yeah, I'm not able to turn it with just my friction. Oh, maybe I am a touch. Let's see. Is my I just saw it a second ago. There we go. I'm gonna bring out my eraser just to see if that'll help me screw it down a, a bit. And I may just have to finish this up off off camera just so I can get to it. Maybe use a little bit of heat or really be able to bear down on it. It's, it's, go, it's getting there a little bit. Yeah, I'm really having to press this in, so I'll finish it up off camera. But it's mostly there. But that's the idea. I'll pump that back out. This is again, another tool from pen tooling. Put that to the side. And that is it. And we have our two pens, so let me grab my piece of paper and maybe we can actually do a little bit of writing. And I'll tell you just some quick facts. So there's a lot of videos about the Parker 51. So I don't think I'm gonna go into super, super express detail. But I use parker51.com, um, Richard Bender's site, a couple really good websites online, and they all say the same thing. So they're probably all fact-checking each other, to be honest, or they all used the Richard Bender site at one point to get their information. So let's see if I can reposition everything so we can do some writing. Yeah, let's try Let's try that and let's see if we can pick out an ink real quick. Let's do, what am I going to pull out? What about this one? This is lavender black. This is from platinum. Let's give that a shot. So, let's do the demonstrator first. Okay, so here we go. Let's give that a shake. It's going to be a good focus for us to really see. Okay, so just like all the other vacuumatics, we're going to dip it. 
and there we go, it's coming out. So we see it pushing air out, making a vacuum, and it comes back in through that breather tube. And that's what's gonna fill us up. So that's pretty fun. How high can I get it? And that might be about it. Okay. All right. Let's get a paper towel. Let's see what we've done. A lot of bubbles in this. Interesting. So here we go. Let's see if we can zoom in. Is there any detail that we can get out of it? I mean, there's the collector in there. It's all saturated. We've got the feed and nib also, you know, already kind of coated with some ink. And we have this nice chamber. So pretty good. So let's talk about some basic facts and then I'll kind of point out on here, like kind of what the big ideas were um, that made this pen so kind of unique. Okay, so let's start writing. So we'll figure out the, the angle of this here. So Parker 51, can you see that? Yeah, that's come out so far. Okay, so where to start? So development of this was in the late 30s finally being finished in 1939. So that's the big year that, that's the 51st year of the Parker Pen Company. Hence, it's gonna be called the Parker 51. Now they weren't sure if this was going to fly because they were really trying to go for a pen that was way ahead of its time. One of the earliest marketing for this pen was a pen that was 10 years ahead of its time. Right. So they'd done a lot of engineering on this pen. It was definitely a form follows function kind of a pen. So they were shooting to kind of have a pen that wouldn't have any hard starts, um, be resistant to drying out. So they had to, at the same time as making the pen, they had to make a special ink. And it was the, you know, Parker 51 ink. Well, my, my handwriting's gone to crap today. For 51 ink, and I think it eventually went to Super Chrome. Yeah, and the, the special thing about this was it was a very alkaline ink. So it would eat away at a lot of the celluloids of the time and probably certain plastics. So part of the development of this pen was, well, what material can we use that will um, go along with this alkaline ink that's going to be fast drying and water resistant. So they turned to a particular pl type of plastic called Lucite, which was in the aviation industry. Apparently they used it to make the nose cones of airplanes. So very rugged, scratch resistant, alkaline resistant plastic. So that's what they turn to. So the way they designed this pen is they have the hood. So they were combating a couple things, right? So with exposed nibs, man, that's a bad nib. There we go. Okay. Exposed nibs on the top and then nibs on the bottom. You had, you know, places where ink can dry, evaporate, and be exposed to the elements. So you had, you know, the breather hole, you had all these fins that were saturated ink, kind of collecting ink that, you know, escaped from the channel that's underneath the nib. So you had all these areas of exposed ink. So um, how do we do that? Well, let's take our nib and we'll put it in a hood so that 
there's less exposure to air and sun and light. So all this area is now shaded and not as well ventilated. So that's kind of getting at some of the evaporation and drying issues. So, but at the same time, you know, you have this, these big nibs. So how do you make something that's not super clunky fit around these nibs? So their solution was, hey, let's make a nib that wraps around its feed. And that's how we get these very specific Parker nibs that go around this long slender feed, right? So now you have a nib that is hugging um, the feed itself. And that feed brings up the ink in its channel, saturates your collector, which is now protected, and you have something that is going to be now all the time covered in ink and protected from the environment. So that was the idea of creating a little micro environment for the nib itself. And then another part as far as going for the ink, the fast drying ink meant that as you put it on the paper, it was going to dry, but not here. So that was, that was the idea. And so apparently when they sent it down, when they did their first test market, they sent it down to extreme environments. They sent it down to South and Latin America. So it's hot, it's humid, it's going to be very rough. So they, they, they were going to see how these, this ink and this pen performed. It did really well, such that in about 1940, let's see, I'm going to have to move now because there we go. They started sending it to the US markets, which would be, I think, Denver. I saw Chicago. I think I saw San Francisco and maybe New York. New York just makes sense. Very metro cities as far as New York, Chicago. Then you kind of top it off with, you know, San Francisco, Denver. So San Francisco down by the waterline, Denver up in the mountains. So he had a, a range of areas that could really show the environments in which the pen would work. And so things went well there. And so, and finally, move camera again. In January of 1941, was the wide release. And I'm not making firm contact. These are not skips. This is just me kind of rolling the pen a little bit. So wide release. And of course, as we all know, by this point, super successful, kind of became a status symbol, even to the point where people would just buy the caps so that they could put the cap on another pen, have it sticking out of their pocket, and just kind of get the um, notoriety of owning a Parker 51. And I say notoriety because I did see one thing. Apparently, these pens did cost about twelve fifty at the time for the most basic model. And if you go for like all gold, gold cap, this lather and gold, it's going up in the eighty to hundred dollar range. So, the one website may have been Parker51.com. I forget if that's the one, but they said that the median income was about $25 per month. So holy cow, that is about half a monthly income. So these were not cheap. Um, maybe they were bought on installment plans, I don't know. But this definitely was a status symbol because everybody, like, this is a, such a weird, drastic design um, that they just had to do it. And what else, what else can I do? And as far as the some of the features of the pen, what did I write down? Bum, 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 bum. There we go. So these came out in 1941, so they copied the vacuumatic design. So these do have the plungers up until about 1948 when they went to the Aerometric. And I'll say something about the Aerometric. The Aerometric is, I think, is supposed to be a design that was meant to be able to go up in planes and resist the changes in altitude and hence that super long breather tube um, in your silicone sac, I think, was kind of the one that's supposed to kind of prevent, like, 
you know, incidental sloshing of ink that come all the way out that channel. So I think that was the big um, change for that one. Otherwise, just changes in pressure would, you know, pull ink or, even, yeah, expand a sac, pull, pull ink out the nib. So I think it was the aerometric was really referring to this silicone sac with a long breather tube in it. So there we go there. And this, let's see, anything else? I think that's about it. I mean, there's so many resources out there, but I think the big takeaway is like new material, interesting design for the collector, interesting design for the nib and the feed, all for the purpose of creating this little micro environment to kind of reduce um, evaporation, keeping everything wet, moist, so that you could, oops, got a little blob, um, put the pen down, pick it up at some time later, and it would just come back to writing, no hard starts. And something I saw from Wasky Squirrel on YouTube, he was talking about it. He was saying, and this, this kind of makes sense, being in the 1940s, um, these are nibs that are hooded, so they, there's, I don't think you're ever going to get a flexible Parker 51 nib, partly because there's really no room for it to flex, but also at the time these were aimed at, you know, business people, right? People who would be trying to write things, and since they didn't have copy machines at the time, they were a lot of writing on carbon paper so you had to have a nib that would be able to press through the paper create a line that would transfer through the different layers and so part of the form follows function is you have these nice kind of I guess in the vein of a triumph nib these round conical kind of tubular nibs that just don't allow for much flexibility so another thought process going into the Parker 51 so let me just kind of critique this guy real quick so this is a clearly a fine rider. This is a fine, 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 fine line. And let me do a little bit of pressing. I'm not getting anything out of it. Let me see if I can see how wet this guy is. It's fine, so it shouldn't be super wet, but we'll see what the ink does. Actually, it's a wetter ink than I thought it would be. Okay, so probably this is probably more a function of the nib. Let me get some paper out of my, my tines. So, there we go. Well, if I didn't lay it down, let me just make some lines. Yeah, okay, if I don't layer it down, it feathers out rather quickly, so not super wet. Let's see if I can do reverse writing. And then here's normal. doesn't really change it that much. Maybe the smallest bit smaller, but it that's negligible. Maybe, yeah, a little, a touch smaller, just a little bit. So it does do reverse writing, and it's, it's starting to feel scratchy, but you can definitely do it, so not bad. And the, and the nib, as far as it goes, being a fine one, I wouldn't call this scratchy. Again, pen on paper, I feel it, it's kind of nice. A little bit of a feedback, but I don't feel it digging into the paper. I can go left, right, up, down without it catching. So to me, this is not a scratchy nib. And as far as holding it, this, let me zoom out. This is a standard kind of normal size model, which let's see if I can pull out the ruler. Let's go to the inches. From the bottom of the blind cap to the nib itself is right about five inches. So definitely a good size not too skinny I can dare try to get a diameter of it so it's just shy of half an inch at its fattest um, along the barrel so definitely a comfortable writer um, the only thing I can say is maybe with the material um, there's no textured section so I wonder if writing for a while are you gonna slide down the barrel are you gonna slide back up it um, hopefully not. I mean, every material has its own little properties, like writing with metal versus ebonite versus hard rubber versus these plastics. And right now, it actually feels pretty secure. I don't feel like this is too slippery of a plastic. Um, the only thing I could say you might feel is this clutch ring. So as I hold it, not too bad, but I can feel it back here. So if you kind of write far back, you might get onto the clutch ring, which might be a bit annoying, but not a deal breaker. So. 
I think even though it's being streamlined, smooth, all plastic, at least for now, I feel like I can hold this comfortably. And should you want to post it, which you don't need to, post steeply, super securely, and I will say that it does, being a metal cap, it does add more weight to the back. So as far as a light pen, unposted would be more comfortable. But it's not really dragging me back. Like, it, it's a little bit back heavy, but it's not terrible. I could shift back a little bit, have plenty of room to shift back and kind of keep writing to kind of like shift the balance of that weight. But I don't think capping it or uncapping is going to make too much of a difference, but you definitely don't need to cap it. What else? The cap is nice. Firmly on there. And actually, oops, pulled some more ink out. Um, I really have to pull, so the, the clutch and the, the clutch ring are definitely easy. And I think Wasky Squirrel, the same video I was watching the other day, was saying that, you know, one of the other innovations was, hey, this is a boom, saves you just, you know, probably a second or two um, if you wanted to, like, uncap a pen and throw this down um, and start writing with it. So maybe a bit of a time saver, just barely. Maybe it adds up in the business world. And also with this, you probably... Um, kind of lose the issue of threads wearing out over time. You know, if this were a metal cap onto plastic or celluloid threads, that would wear it out, but this kind of eliminates that problem. And this is like what, uh, I think this is a 1948 pen from the date code I had on here. Um, this is what, over 50, 60, 70, between 70 and 80 year old pen. So it's a locking system that works. So let's move on to the aerometric, just for sake of seeing the filling and the writing of that. But what I'm going to do is just to see how good this like stands up to being um, resist drying out. I'm actually gonna I'm gonna cap it, and I'm not gonna use it, or maybe I'll use it every few days. But I'll revisit this particular pen um, on my next video and see if it picks up writing. So let's kind of put this one to a test. Okay, so here's the plum, and let me just show off the plum. I hope the light captures it on my camera. I can't tell super well, but I mean, in the lights that I can see for myself, this is a nice plum color, and we have the cap jewel. That's nice and clear. I do have to re-tighten that down a little bit. Got a little bit more tight, but I have to work on that. The cap turned out to be a little bit matte, but still got some shine to it. We have this barrel. There's a little bitty breather hole down here at the bottom, which apparently later in the line, maybe in the 50s, um, they they took it from the tip to the side. It's another way of dating it. And let's see. I have my loop. Let me just see if there's anything, because you'll often see imprints right here. This is where it's gonna say Parker, made in USA, maybe a date coat, so right under here. So when you do, if you do use MicroMesh, be aware that's where you're looking. Maybe a little bit to tape up there just to protect the imprint. So let me take a quick look. And this one looks to be clean. I'm not seeing any imprint on this guy. So this is unimprinted. Yep. Okay. So I think based on the breather hole, um, it's probably going to be probably early 50s pen. Um, and it is an earlier one because we can also say from this aerometric filler with the plastic cap at the tip, it does tend to put it back towards the beginning of the line. And let's go ahead and see if we can read what's on the aerometric filler. So Parker 51. To fill, press ribbed bar firmly four times, holding pen point down, white point with soft tissue, use Parker Ink. The Parker Pen Company made in USA, and no date on this thing. Okay. So let's do that actually. Let's go ahead and Depress firmly four times. Let's see if we can hear what's going on. One, 
two, three, four. We'll do a couple more just for kicks. Okay. Grab my towel and we'll wipe off the tip with this washable bamboo tissue. Let's see how this guy goes. Make sure he's starting. Maybe wipe some ink out of the out of the nib. There we go. Wow. I'm gonna do one thing. It's not writing right away. There it is. A little bit. It's kind of a tight one. Maybe I need to check out the nib to see if it's a little tight, but I'm going to just kind of prime it, squeeze an ink drop it out. See if we can just prime it, make sure I didn't just wipe stuff away and make it a dry nib. Oh, interesting, interesting. I might actually have to take a look at this pen under the loop. There it goes. It's definitely a fine, but it just doesn't seem to want to be writing. It looks as though probably under the loop, these are just really tight tines. It looks aligned, but the gap, let's see if I can write. Um, oh yeah, I have to press hard to kind of open it up. So these tines, rather than having the smallest bit of a gap, they are really just that tight together. So I might have to work on maybe pressing them apart, pressing them up, um, or pulling them down to see if I can open up the nib a little bit. So I'm not sure that we're gonna see this guy right. But I can probably tell already, it's gonna be a fine line. And just rubbing on the paper, it doesn't feel scratchy. Under the loop I saw I had plenty of nibbing material, so it's not scratchy left, right, up, down. And we're gonna have the same ink properties, but I think it's just a little bit too tight, so I'm gonna work on that for myself. And maybe when we come back and see the if the other pen still writes, I'll see if I can have this opened up a little bit. And we can get a writing sample, but for that, since you know we're not going to have much else for this pen, and I think the comments I made as far as the comfort and the size is, are going to be the same, so I'll go ahead and see. I squeezed a few drops out. What do we get? Let's see. There we go. White background. There's one squeeze, two squeeze. Yeah, getting some bubbles with some in there. Let me, this has a plastic thing. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of this plastic thing. Let's see. One, two, three, four. I did the four. Yeah, that's that was a better fill. Okay. Let's go ahead and wipe this down. Ugh, this was a process plagued with issues hard to get apart, um, my own mistake in the beginning, uh, a pellet for the vacuumatic that just was way too big, so I had to get creative, so a lot of things going on with these pens. And now I don't know that this one's not gonna write until we give it a shot, so sorry for the length, sorry for the hiccups in this one, but such is life, and this is what we would do. We would bring it back to life, find an issue, and then we have to go address it. And this one happens to be the nib, and that's not terrible. It's fairly easy to take care of, so I'll take care of that off camera. Let's just, just see this guy real quick. So it's been sitting over there and picking right back up. So far, so good. Okay, let me get cleaned up a little bit. And let's go ahead and do the promo for next time. And I have it right here next to me. 
And this is partly to correct a misspeak that I had earlier. But let's go ahead and do a Parker 61, the guy with the arrow on the top. So yeah, I was, I was kind of mixing up my 61, 75. Um, so we'll do a Parker 61, which is kind of similar to the Schaefer snorkel that I mentioned the other day, a way of keeping a cleaner nib filling system. So we have the capillary filling system. So we will tackle that one next time. Put that guy there, zoom back out. And we'll see if this one's still writing. We'll see if I can get this nib to open up. So we'll revisit a bunch of these kind of hooded, semi-hooded pens. So let's, yeah, let's stick on brand and stick with the theme of hooded, semi-hooded. And we'll come back and do these guys next time. So thank you for the long, sticking around for the long um, video. I know it's gonna be a ch bit choppy, a bit edited, but you saw the process and that's just how it goes sometimes. You have to figure some stuff out. So happy to have you along for the journey and we will see you next time.